Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. All right. So today we have something very special planned for you guys. I believe that everybody in this building is going to come out of here taking something away, something unique, something personal for you. I guarantee you everybody is going to gonna you're gonna love it i'm just gonna say that and so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go ahead and jump right in so i think it was i'm really bad with time but i'll just say i think it was about two and a half months ago god warned me that i need to prepare myself and so i was thinking okay prepare myself for what and god told me that you need to prepare yourself to handle a new level of discomfort god told me that the direction that you're heading is good. You're following me. You're on a path that I've set out for you. And as you go, there's going to be things that you need to do that are uncomfortable. And so I said, okay. And I did what any rational person would do in this day and age. And I went on Google and I looked up, how do I develop my mental capacity? How can I um, enhance my, my mental endurance, my emotional endurance? And so I found this article online that said, if you force yourself to take a cold shower, Every single morning, or it could be in the evening. If you force yourself to take a cold shower, it will greatly increase your ability to handle things that you normally don't want to handle. And I was like, okay, a cold shower, right? So I'm weird, you guys. So I was like, okay, let's go for it. It took me two weeks to build up the nerve to be able to, to even try it. You know, I would touch the cold water. I was like, oh, this is not happening. Um, but after two weeks, I said, okay, you know, I just got to do it. Let me try it. Let me see how it works. And so I went for it, um, you know, turned on the cold water and, and jumped in. Let me tell you, there is absolutely no transition into cold water. You can't smooth your way into there. You can't do anything. It's just like the first five to ten seconds, you just scream. You're just like, oh. But after that, it's good. You know, you, I, can, I can honestly say. So it's been, I think I've been doing it for two months now. I absolutely, yeah, two months I've been doing it. I, I love it. There was, okay, there was one day where I got to be honest, I cracked. And I just said, no, you know, I'm not doing this. It was a Sunday morning. I was sleep deprived. I felt like I was getting sick. And I was like, you know what, God, no, I'm not doing this. And then so after that, the next day I did it. And then another time, I just took vacation. I thought it was fun to take a, a warm shower. But you know what? I think two months and two off days, that's pretty good. But it has greatly helped me to, to give that. I can't explain it, but you just get an oomph to want to, like, whenever something comes, you're just like, I can handle this. If I can do a cold shower, I can take this. And so it has really helped me. Um, so why am I saying all this? There's one point that I want you guys to take away from what I'm about to share uh, with you right now. And they can display it on the screens. But what I want you guys to take away from this is uh, it's very simple. And that is how you journey will determine your success. How you journey will determine your success. And I'm going to illustrate this for you guys, actually. So on this board, I, I pre-drew it out. But can everybody see it? OK. And so what I've realized is a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll, well, let me explain this first. So this is you know the mountains. You have the high tops and the valleys. And you know, you're going up and up and up. And this is basically like your success, in a sense. And so I've noticed that a lot of people, they measure their individual success based on what they've accomplished, right? You know, because I've done this, because I've done that, I can say that I'm a successful person. You know, I haven't done this yet, so I don't feel successful. And so I was looking at this, and I figured, this is kind of ridiculous. Because you look at this, your, your success moment, it is so small in comparison to the journey you have to take to get there. And so I felt like my focus should be more on the journey of getting to my high points. And I, I believe that I was onto something. And so I'm going to share an example of a bad journey. Um, those of you that have your Bibles, go with me to Exodus chapter 16, verse 2 through 4. Exodus 16, 2 through 4. If you don't have your Bible, shame on you, but we have it on the screens. So it's all good. Um, Okay, so I'll set the tone while you guys are, are getting there. If you don't know the story about Exodus, um, it's about 
God's people, the Israelites, where they were under captivity of the Egyptians. <clears throat> and so for 400 years, they were the Egyptian slaves. So day and night, the Egyptians would work the Israelites. It's kind of like, hey, make me a sandwich. Man, I am hungry. Go do it right now. Or it was kind of like, you know what, man? You need to get back to work. We have things to do. We got places to be. We have kingdoms to build, legacies to develop. I don't have time for you to complain about your broken leg, man. Wrap that thing up and get to work. And so day and night, the Egyptians would work the Israelites until one day God responded, and he sent Moses to them. Now Moses brought the smack down on Pharaoh with ten horrible plagues, and to top it off, God wiped out Pharaoh's entire army in the Red Sea. And so before you know it, you have the Israelites, God's people, who are free. And so God told them, I'm going to take you to a land that I've promised for you. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And what that means basically today is that it's, it's a land that's off the hook, man. You can't even find this on the realtor site. It's amazing. And so he promises them that he's going to take them there. And so this story kind of picks up right as they're going in the wilderness, but trouble comes. And so we're right in the middle of that. So we're going to pick up Exodus 16, 2 through 3. So it says, in the desert, the whole community told Moses and Aaron they weren't happy with them. The Israelites said to them, we wish the Lord had put us to death in Egypt. There we sat our own pots of meat. We ate all the food we wanted. But you, Moses, you have brought us out of this desert. You want the entire community to die of hunger, don't you? You know, so I can only imagine Moses saying, like, man, sit down. We're all hungry. Let me go talk to God and figure this out. And so the next verse, you know, God swoops in. The Lord spoke to Moses and says, hey, I hear you guys are arguing down there, and I believe that I can help. And he says, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people must go out each day, have them gather enough bread for that day. Here is how I will test them. I will see if they will follow my directions. Now, there's the key right there. <clears throat> the last two sentences. Here is how I will test them. I will see if they will follow my directions. Now, those of you who know the story, tell me, did the Israelites pass the test? No, they did not. They failed horribly. Time after time after time, they failed the test over and over to the point where it's ridiculous. There was only two people out of the entire community that were able to go into the promised land. But that's ridiculous. You know, on the defense, if I was with the group, I'd probably do a lot more than grumbling. After the first three days of going out there, there was no water. And so if there's no water after three days for me, it's like, I'm going to do a lot more than grumbling. I'm going to start finding some things. I'm going to start killing camels, and I'm going to do all of that. But, you know... There's, there's something that God is trying to tell us here. And so this next example that I want to show you is, is actually, it's from, I think that this person by far did the best job of articulating how to be successful with God. You know, out of anyone, and uh, this person is Paul. And so Paul, he gave us a good example, and this is in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And so, again, you can look to the screen. <clears throat> I'll read from there. It says, so this is Paul saying, not that I was ever in need, but during my journey, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. During my journey, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. During my journey, I have learned the secrets of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or an empty one, with plenty or little. During my journey, I have discovered that I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And so this is, this is um, 1,300 years later. Paul figured this out. He shared it with all of us to let us know the secret of being successful is learning how to be content in your obedience with God. And so let's look at this word content. What does that even mean? And so, content means satisfied with what one is or has, not wanting more or anything else. Being content. So, that is the secret. And so, what is so fascinating about this is that Paul looks at his life, right? He says, man, I have been beaten up. I've been stoned. 
I've been falsely accused. I've been imprisoned. I've been shipwrecked. Man, I even got bitten by a snake. And he notices there's a pattern here. Everything that's been going on, God is testing me. He's trying to figure out if I will do what he says and be content while doing it. And so Paul says, if you can do that, if you can do those two things, obey God and be content, you'll win every time. You'll be successful at anything. And that is probably the hardest thing to do. You know, for the past three weeks, I thought that I was going through a funk. I would um, I'd look at my life and I would be, I would be frustrated. Actually, I have a, I have a um, example I want to show you guys. So, it's right underneath the seat. Okay, so, God told me that he was going to take me somewhere on a mountaintop, right? So God told me, Frank, I'm going to take you here. And he said, you're going to need an axe. And I said, all right, let's do this. And he said, on this journey, I'm going to need you to cut down some trees. And I said, okay, that sounds simple enough. And then I, I went for it. So God planned out everything. And so I began to work. Going down the mountain, I see the new mountain. I just start cutting away. This is a lot harder than it seems. Okay, grab from here. And so as I'm going, you know, I'm feeling good. I feel like I'm on God's path. I'm going. I'm cutting down. I'm chopping everything. And let's say two weeks go by. And then I'm not complaining, but I say, like, man, God, this is hard work. But I like where I'm going. I can see the destination. My eyes are focused on the destination. And so I get back to work, cutting. Until... I cut so many trees down, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not moving as fast as I want to move right now. I can see the progress, but it's not going fast enough. And I begin to get frustrated at where I'm at because I look at other people going up their mountains at a much faster pace than I do. I look at other people's mountain tops, and I'm like, why can't I get there, God? And so I still, you know, I'm cutting away, and I get to the point where I'm frustrated, I'm fed up, and I'm angry that I'm not there yet. Because I see the top, right? But these darn trees are in my way. And so God tells me, I can't do anything with your anger. I can't do anything with your frustration. But there's something that you have that I can do something with. And I'm like, what does that even mean, God? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I don't really take it into heart, and I continue working. <laughs> Eventually, I get to that breaking point where it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, you, you look at your work, you know that you've worked, but you're not satisfied, that you're not there yet. And you have that moment where you're like, like, I want to follow you, God, but this is impossible. I'm not going to get there. And in that moment, God reminded me, I can't do anything with your anger. I can't do anything with your frustration. But there's two things that you have that I can do something with. It's like, okay, God, what are those things? If you submit to me, I can do something with that. And if you admit that you're weak and you can't do it, I can do something with that. It's like, okay. I get it. And so I try again. You know, I get the revelation, but I'm not quite there yet. Can you chopping until I reach that point again and God reminds me there's two things that he can do something with. But at this point, you guys, I'm telling you, like I'm at I'm at edge. You know, I am I'm on my knees and I'm looking at these trees and I say, I I want to follow you, but I don't know how. I don't know how anymore. And so he brings me to that point where you have to say, you know what? Okay, I don't have the strength to do this, God. And I want to submit to you. So what do I need to do? And God tells you, he tells me, pick up the axe and start swinging. But it's like, God, I've, I've tried that. It hasn't gotten me anywhere. Pick up the axe and keep swinging. And so, you know, you get up pick up the axe and I look at those trees in my life 
And I say, I can't do this. God says, yes, you can. There's so many trees, God. I know, but you can't do anything about that. This ground, it's so shifty. I can't even get a foothold to swing anymore. You can't do anything about that. The air is so thin up here. You can't do anything about that. Just swing. And so God tells me that, that we can work on this together. And so we're swinging, and we're swinging, and we're swinging. And before you know it, we cut through the last tree. And then I can see at the top my destination. And so I go up the destination, and I realize what God can do through me when I admit that I can't do it, and when I admit that I want to follow him. And then I look back down at where I was, and you know all you can say is, wow, what a trip. And so there's this principle here that I want you guys to understand is that your success comes in the journey. Don't define yourself by your high points because they're just moments. They're just vapors. Look at where God is trying to take you and learn how to enjoy the journey. That's where it all matters. It's amazing, you know, and you start to think, can our God get any better than this, right? And I have to tell you, yes, he can. Church family, can you please help me welcome Pastor Anthony Stamps to the stage. That was so good, Frank. What a trip. Love it. You know, we, we, um, we hear the word transition, and I think a lot of us can say we can instantly associate that with um, Christianity, right? I don't think you don't really hear that word too much otherwise. And so I think tonight we, we really want to uh, um, stay away from, from the comfortability of this language because here's why. When we get comfortable with these sayings, with these statements, it, we start to grow numb now. And then we start to hear them, and then we repeat them, and then we encourage other people using those same very words. But at the same time, somehow our faith begins to dwindle in those very areas of those very statements. And so we hear this word transition, and we think, and we hear about, man, this, 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 this example he's given of, of chopping through trees, and we just grow very numb to it because we've all been through transitions before. We all know it doesn't feel great, and, but yet we want to, we want to, count ourselves happy through it all and so we grow very numb but I really believe that there's times when we have to really look through a different window uh, in, in these in these seasons of transitions and these seasons of journeys and we have to start to position ourselves in a different window and start to look at things a little differently because God just might be trying to do a new thing with an old person he just might be trying to do a new thing with an old mindset. However, we don't have the capacity to hold that new thing, so we burst at the seams with negativity, with doubt, with fear, with worry, and anxiety. However, I really believe that God wants to show us this new window and how to do that. We talk about transitions, and we go from season to season, and, and I think it's important for us to know that that. One season to the next is never going to look the same. Has very similar characteristics about it. Uh, has very similar feelings and emotions, but it'll never look the same. Uh, the victories you had last year are going to look a lot different from the victories you have in this coming year. And the same goes with trials and pain. The, the pains you had last year are going to look a lot different from the pains you're having this next year. In fact, the person next to you has a season that looks a lot different from yours. In fact, the two people next to you their seasons look a lot different, and no one will ever have a season that looks like the other person's. Our job is to identify our role, our role in that season, our role in that transition. Yet we tend to make this common mistake, and what we do is we make judgments, we make crucial decisions, we make crucial uh, uh, um, um, life changes in these seasons all because of what we hear of someone else's victory. 
We hear someone else having a great time. They made it to their mountaintop. They got that new house. They got that job promotion. They got married. They did this. They did that. And we look at our little season and we're wondering, why is it taking so long? And so we begin to make decisions. We begin to change the course. I'm not going to go this way anymore. This way has, has run its course. It's not working. I'm going to change the other direction because over there, that person's getting a promotion. That person's getting married. That person's moving up in life. I'm going to change courses now. But what we, what we fail to see is the journey as the trees in the middle of that person's success that they had to chop through. Right? Kind of like, <clears throat> kind of like moving. How, how many of you have ever been to or attended um, housewarming parties, show of hands, housewarming parties? Man, isn't it awesome? You, you get to these housewarming parties, right? They invite you over. They just moved in, right? You walk in. The floors are freshly mopped, smelling like Clorox. They got the vanilla scented candles on a coffee table, right? Or it's Thanksgiving dinner. You got the, all the, the dinnerware that they never use, but they're going to use it tonight, and it's all set up on the table. Everything looks wonderful. Everything smells great, looks great. The toilet paper is stacked like a pyramid on the toilet. Everything is looking beautiful out of sight, and it's like, man, you look at that, and like, I want to move. Man, I want a new place. I, I want to get something. I, I want something different. You know what? Um, honey, we're moving. We're doing something new. We're going to take a leap of faith. We're going to step on out. I'm tired of this old stuff. I, I've ne I, I'm tired of this. I want something new. So you decide to make a decision based on what you saw. You make a decision because what you saw was attractive, what you saw was awesome, and what you have and what you see in front of you is nowhere not like that. Maybe two years ago, two years ago it was when you first moved there, but now it's not. So I'm going to make this move. I'm going to make this decision. And so you, you have your eyes fixed on what it's going to look like, right? You're already going on Pinterest. You're looking at everything, all the furniture you're going to get. You have this perfect image of when you're going to walk in and you're going to smell for breeze and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be this beautiful image thing, right? You walk in, you get the house, you sign the lease, everything's good to go. And now it's a glorious time of packing. Packing and finally discovering that your clothes and all your items suddenly get this power of multiplying like rabbits. And now you have more things moving out than when you did moving in. And now you're packing and packing and now you're wondering whose decision was it to move? Who made this wild decision to go ahead and move dealing with all of this? And time's running out, and the clock is running thin, and all of a sudden, you got a million and one other things to do, and you're just trying to get out and get into this new place so you could light your candles. You just want to get out and throw a housewarming party so you can make up and relax for all of that stress that you went through packing. And then two years later, you want to do it again. Three years later, four years later, and then you give up, and then you say, you know what, I'm done with this. I don't want to try to move anymore. We're staying here. You can get settled and all that fun stuff, right? My point to this we a lot of times make our own setbacks, disappointments because of our itching ears that love and are attracted to great news. And instead of embracing this journey, this transition that you're on, instead of, instead of letting it develop something in you, instead you want to skip over. And we just somehow think that getting from glory to glory is like this hop, skip, and a jump. When in fact, it's more of like a hop, skip, jump, tumble, tough mutter, Spartan race, marathon, bike climb, triathlon. And then maybe, if you're lucky, you'll get to make it to the top. We never look at it like that. We always look like it's just going to jump right through. We're going to get right through it. And there's a, there's a, a, a time in, in the Bible and with Israel where uh, they, they experienced it and they made decisions based on what they saw as opposed to what God really had for them. And it ruined them, and it hurt them, and it set them back. And I want us to go in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse, we're going to start in verse 4. And so at this time right now, Israel is without a king. They haven't had a king since they were freed from slavery uh, they've had judges and everything to help with disputes and making decisions as a nation. And, and they had counselors and elders and all of that, but they didn't have a king. God himself put himself as king over his people. How many of you would love to, give, to, to respond to a king like God? Yet they had 
other nations around them had kings and, and all kinds of royalty and, and royal figures and everything. But Israel didn't have a king. And much like their past and their history, they desired one. They wanted one so bad, but not because they necessarily needed it. They wanted one because every nation around them had a king. And they were tired of being the odd man out. Now they wanted a king. And so in verse 4, it says this, Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. And so at this point, Samuel's like heartbroken. He's upset. He's like, how can you, how can, how can you sit here and say that, man, God is not enough as your king, and yet you want, you want an earthly king who probably isn't going to last more than, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years. And here you have an eternal God who, who's giving you everything you need and some, who's answering all of your, your prayers, who's doing everything for you, and, and you want a king? And so he, he brings this matter to God. He comes to God and he says, God, man, this is what, this is what they want. What do I do? And, and God says, look, Samuel, you're going you're gonna to give them what they want. However, you're going to let them know exactly what they're going to get. So Samuel goes on, uh, God begins to tell Samuel everything that's going to happen. And he wants him to tell the people, this is what you're going to get when you ask for a king. He goes on, goes on. And, and, and even God's heartbroken. Like, Listen, I, they don't want me as their king. I want to be their king. And so they go on and on and on and on. And then finally, Samuel comes back to the people, tells them everything just word for word as God said it. Everything, all the, all the, all the, 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 the raids and the death and the loss and the slavery and everything that was going to take place however they said this but the people refused in verse 19 but the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning even so we still want a king they said even though I have to spend hours and hours packing I still want that house even though even though I know the repercussions of what it may look like uh, surrounding myself in environments where I broke free of addictions, um, I still want to go to that party. I still want to hang out with those people. They're still my friends. Even though I know that when I begin to stop praying, um, things begin to happen that I don't like to happen. When I stop reading my word, I lose focus and I lose control. I still want to sleep. I still want to chill. I still want to take it easy. I And so... It, God is, is laying out what's going to happen. He's showing everything that's going to happen. And yet they still refuse the, the, the answer that Samuel brought to them. And they said, we still want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. We don't want to be God's people. We want to be like everyone else. We don't want to be the chosen and hand-selected and rescued and saved. We want to be like the destroyed, like the ruins, like those have been raided and, 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 and brought down to shambles. We want to be like them. We don't want our royal inheritance as children of God. That's what they're saying. We don't want that anymore. We want a king. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. And so verse 21, so Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent them home. And so here we are and we have the people of Israel. They're, they're going through a little journey. They're taking a little trip. And their trip is started in Egypt when they were freed cap from being captive of slavery, right? They're in, they're in Egypt. They're, they got set free. They're, they're on their way forward now. Then here they are, they, 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 they made it to the promised land, they did all these things, they won the wonderful victories, wonderful everything, uh, but now they're just not satisfied. But they're beginning to make decisions of what their end is going to look like based on what they see in the now. And I really believe that this, this speaks to us even in this very day. I mean, we're hearing of of signs of war we're seeing disaster we're seeing famine we're seeing everything all, all these, these these horrible uh, experiences going on right now in this season in this time and we have people making crazy decisions 
based on what they feel at the moment. I don't, I don't trust God anymore. Why would God let this happen? All this grumbling, all these, all these, all these, 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 these things that are valid emotions, they're valid feelings, all right? There, there's, there's real stuff happening. You may be experiencing some real pain and some real heartache and some real setbacks and real disappointments and real challenges that you have fought continuously for. But God doesn't see with the eyes that you and I see with. And I think we forget that, or maybe we just need to be reminded from time to time that our eyes see things differently from how God's eyes sees things. God tells us in Samuel that, he says, he tells Samuel, Samuel, I don't see the way, these things the way humans see things. I see what's in the heart. When you're in your transition and you're in your way from one season to the next, you, you, just, you just finished this one beautiful victory and you're headed to your next one. There is going to be a time of testing. There is going to be a time of challenge. However, what you see with your eyes is nothing compared to what God is using to develop your heart. God will use these challenges, this transition to develop the heart because the heart is what he cares about. Do you hear what I'm saying? You may not see things shift in the, in the natural with your eyes. You may not see things because God doesn't see things the way we see things. You're asking for signs. You're asking for, for something to change today. But God doesn't see the way you and I see. You're asking for your marriage to, to come to life and, and to be restored. But yeah, you, you're, not, you're not doing the work. You're not putting in the effort. And, and you want things to change now. But God doesn't see things the way you see things. You want your, your child who's been going through his challenges, her challenges, and you want them to suddenly just break free out of that, become a new person, and all of a sudden change. Uh, but God doesn't see things the way you, you see things. See, God develops the heart. Because it's the heart that he searches for. It's the heart that he longs for. It's your heart's desires that he wants to see happen. God searches and sees the heart. And so when we're in our transition and we're, we're in this place of, uh, of, of a standstill, that is your moment to remind yourself that God is looking at your heart and he wants to see how your heart's going to respond. When David was chosen to be king amongst all of his brothers, everyone in this room today if you would have looked at his brothers, would have agreed that one of them should have been the king. Without a doubt. Everyone in that room did, even Samuel. Everyone agreed that David's brothers should, one of them should have been king. But no one saw the way God saw in that room. And everyone took a step back when this little, short, dwarfy, geeky, scrawny, but loyal but strong in heart, young kid walked in the room and was anointed king of Israel. Why? See, David had the heart and his heart was developed so that when he was anointed king, he could endure those 15 years of hardships, those 15 years of betrayal. See, because it took David 15 years to actually become the king that he was anointed to be when he was 15 years old. 15 years of betrayal, of attempted murder on his life, of slander, of, of losing loved ones. 15 years. That was his transition. That was his trip to becoming king. But God said, I don't see David the way you and you guys look at his physical strength. You guys look at his, his ability to, to go into war. But I'm looking at this, this kid has fought off bears. He has stayed there when no one wanted him. He stayed in the fields when no one wanted him and let him inside. He went hungry sometimes just to take care of these animals. He has the heart to develop on this trip. So what God is saying to you today is your transition matters to him. Your journey from this last season onto this next one, as we finish up this year, we're headed into a new year, it matters to him. The decisions you're going to make in this time, it matters to him. These challenges you're facing at this time, it matters to him. 
But hold on because he's developing your heart. Don't throw in the towel now and change course because what you see isn't lining up with what you want. Because of what you see isn't lining up with, with what other people have and what other people are. And this person is moving forward and it only took them a year to do this. It only took them two years to do this. See, but God is developing your heart because you have been chosen for such a time as this. You have been chosen for a very specific purpose that only you can accomplish. So in your trip, in your journey, stand your ground. Because God looks at your heart, not what's on the outside. Amen? Bow your head and close your eyes. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.